good evening to all the participants. Uh, I am extremely happy today uh, to announce that we have uh, the distinguished leader, speaker, uh, Dr. Jay Prakash Narayan Garu. Uh, please join me in welcoming, sir. Thank you so much, sir, for agreeing to speak with us. Uh, this is the 110th uh, leadership conversation, and uh, we are really very lucky and happy to have you with us uh, this evening. Uh, I will take uh, a moment to give the introduction, and after that, we will uh, very, very quickly jump into the conversation with your opening remarks, sir. Uh, please allow me to share the screen. These are Wise Views Leadership Conversations. Uh, we have been hosting these conversations typically every Friday, Friday, 6.30 p.m. Uh, that has become more or less a standard time for us. Uh, this is the 110th Leadership Conversation. As I mentioned, we are going to have this discussion on fiscal prudence and economic growth. 25 minutes of introduction, uh, opening remarks by Dr. Jay Prakash Narengaru, followed by Q&A. Typically, the Q&A runs for 40 to 50 minutes, sir. And then a brief sum up, and we close the session. I take uh, this opportunity as a privilege to introduce this distinguished guest with us. You can Dr. keep Jay it very brief, you know, just a sentence is enough. <laughs> yeah, I have I have tried my best, sir, to reduce uh, four slides into one. Dr. Jay Prakash Narayan is a physician by training and served as an IAS officer for 16 years. He had a tremendously successful tenure and held many important positions in the government of Andhra Pradesh, the combined state of Andhra Pradesh. During the course of his service, he acquired deep insights into the Indian governance process and the problems afflicting the nation. Convinced of the need for radical reforms to transform Indian governance process, Dr. Narayan left the civil services in 1996 and with like-minded colleagues founded the FDR, Foundation for Democratic Reforms and Lok Sattha, which a people's movement for governance and political reforms. Since then, Foundation for Democratic Reforms and Lok Sattha have emerged as the leading civil society initiatives for governance reforms. FDR and Lok Sattha have played a crucial role in driving several reforms over the years and are now focused on true federalism and effective and accountable local governments, rule of law, education, healthcare, and agriculture. Dr. Narayan served as a member of the National Advisory Council, NAC, Second Administrative Reforms and Vigilance Advisory Council. Dr. Narayan is the General Secretary of Foundation for Democratic Reforms. Thank you very much, sir, once again for your uh, time. And I will also take one moment to introduce my esteemed colleague, uh, Professor R. Prasad. He is the director for Academic Wing, and uh, he brings with himself three decades of rich experience as an entrepreneur, as a leader in the corporate world, and now as an academic getting fine. Uh, he holds a BTEC from IIT Bombay and a PGDM from IIM Kolkata. He published uh, several uh, articles books as well as presented papers in India and abroad. Welcome, Professor Prasad, to you as well. Thank you. So we are all eagerly waiting for your talk. And over to you once again. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sudhakar Ragaru, Professor Prasad and friends. Now I'll come straight into the subject. I have been a lifelong fighter for governance reforms, largely about politics of India, rule of law, uh, civil services, service delivery, local governance, electoral reforms, and a whole range of issues. So why am I taking up an economic issue today? There are two reasons. The first is I have realized over the years, perhaps over the decades, that political and governance reform requires enormous patience. And right now for fundamental reforms, there's not much appetite across the political spectrum without going into party politics. But that should not really worry us too much because any society takes a long time to make democracy work. And we have done some very good things in this country. We've also have had some spectacular failures and we have to try and see how best we can move forward. But one lever of change along with technology is economic growth. If economy grows to its potential and India seems to have the opportunity now for a variety of domestic and global reasons, some six, 7% growth rate on a sustained basis for the next 20 to 25 years is a realistic possibility, but it's not guaranteed. At least if the economy grows, A, a lot of people will be brought out of poverty and incomes make them think a little better and make democracy work better. And B, that itself will generate a demand for political reform, better politics, cleaner politics, no money changing hands. We from Telangana, for instance, are very familiar with money changing hands during elections, uh, hundreds of crores of rupees and so on and so forth. So why am I worried about fiscal prudence at this point of time? 
while the economic growth opportunity is real and the world wants us to succeed and we seem to have some desire to succeed, unless the public finances are in a sound state, reasonably sound state, you can kiss the economic growth prospects goodbye. I believe, and I'm saying it with utmost sincerity, I'm not prone to exaggeration or hyperbole. Some of these steps taken in some states, which might spread to the rest of the country, are the most important proximate danger to the growth prospects of India for the next generation or more. And if we now miss this opportunity, certainly during my lifetime, I don't see any realistic hope of significant improvement in Indian politics or society or economy. So I think this danger that we're facing, which is very imminent, must be addressed fairly and squarely and quickly. Now with that, let's go into the slides. I have sent uh, to Sudhakar uh, a, a few slides. We will go through these slides so that no things become a little clearer. I'll quickly run through them. Uh, may I have the first slide, Sudhakar? Subnational fiscal management. Yeah. You can see the red boxes there, the revenue deficits. Now I'm sure everybody is familiar, but for those who are a little unfamiliar, Basically, revenue deficit means even to run the government on a normal plane without any investments or building a future or creating assets, you are forced to borrow money. Now, any household that borrows money to run its day-to-day -day household affairs is obviously in danger. And if it's on a sustained basis, the danger is very, very, very severe because not only is the debt burden mounting without the capacity to earn, interest burden is mounting over time. And you can see many states are in that bracket. The union also is in the same bracket. You take the debt burden. Typically, under the FRBM Act, 20% of GSDP is the ceiling for the state's debt. Now, you may deviate by 3 4% depending on the exigencies. You look at the numbers there. If you actually take the, the last column, which gives the real liabilities, no, oftentimes the states are concealing the debts by off-budget loans, by all kinds of strategies. I don't want to go into detail, special purpose vehicles, et cetera. Without a revenue stream, the government has to repay anyway, but they're pretending as if it's not a government loan. So the last column is important. Andhra Pradesh, 20 is the norm. They've gone to 44%. Telangana, an otherwise rich state, also has gone to 38% of the state GSDP. Tamil Nadu, a rich state, again, 36. Punjab is really in a bad shape, 52%. Rajasthan, 45%. You can go on and on, except Odisha. Orissa is showing what a poor state can do. By better management, the poverty of a state, economic poverty of a state need not affect the public finances if the government is very proactive, farsighted, and prudent. Uh, Karnataka has actually done reasonably well. But in general, almost all states, except three, two or three, they have far exceeded the debt ceiling limits. Remember, government of India itself uh, was about 60% of GSTP. So if you combine both these, we already are at about 90, 90 to 100%. And just to give you a sense of the big picture, if you have nearly 100% of GSTP as the total debt of the governments, union and states put together, even at 7 or 8% average interest rate, you have to spend 8% of GSTP only on interest payments. And that's a huge amount for India because please remember, I want you to at least look at the big numbers. The tax GDP ratio of India, the revenues of the governments at all levels put together in India is roughly about 19%. Out of the 19, 8 is taken away, only for interest payments. So out of the revenues, more than a third, almost 40% is taken away, 40% plus is taken away only in the form of interest. Obviously, it's not a very happy situation. So that's the reason why the debt and the revenue deficits are very important. Next, please. This gives you a snapshot uh, it looks a little complicated, but let me uh, just explain to you. Uh, don't bother about the height of the red and blue bars. Uh, that about the expenditure. But no, look at that uh, that line, uh, that um, golden brown line, that gives you a sense of committed expenditure as a ratio ratio of the revenue receipts. What is committed expenditure? There are three things that no government can ignore. You have to pay salaries, pensions. Interest and debt. Even if you're a wonderful government, you put Mr. Sudhakar Rao and Mr. Professor Prasad in charge of the government, these things you cannot escape because they're already past liabilities incurred. You have to pay salaries, you have to pay pensions, and you have to pay interest. Otherwise, government simply cannot run. Look at the numbers. Already, out of the total revenue receipts, not the state's own resources, revenue receipts, including the union government's transfers to states, 
a lot of money comes from the union government to states. About 18 lakh crores this year is transferred from the union to the states. 18 lakh crores in all forms put together. So including that money, already many, many states are at 60, 70, 80% of the total revenue receipts are only for the committed expenditure, only for the committed expenditure, without spending a rupee even on a fuel or a car or electricity or anything else, or a tour of an employee, let alone providing actual service or building any, any uh, assets. If you take own resources, that is state's own tax revenue, excluding the government of India transfers, the average is 125%, 125%. Some states have reached 160, 170%. This shows you, actually, the math of this is 206%. I told you 170, 160. We take a, a ratio of own revenues of the state, excluding government of India transfers, you reached 125, 130% average, and some states are at almost 200%. I mean, by any standard, this is a danger signal. Next, please. Now, in this context, there's one particular issue that's really going to be an enormous problem unless we address it. World over, there is a pension system. The pensions in the rest of the world, all the mature economies, they apply to the whole population. If you're working in ICFI, if you're a self-employed person, if you're a professional, if you're a private sector employee, if you're an agricultural laborer, Everybody is covered by some kind of a social security pension system. Those who are familiar with the U.S. would know payroll taxes. In India, it only goes to employees. You must understand that. And world over, the pensions are funded through payroll taxes and other means. Every month, the employer and employee put money into the pension fund. Therefore, future pension is drawn from this fund, not from the tax money. Whereas in India, until now, what is called old pension system, under that system, there is no contribution. Zero is put today for future pension. It's only available to government employees, 3% of the total workforce of India. And the next generation pays the pension from the tax money. And it has grievous consequences as the next few slides will show. Therefore, way back in 2004, 2005, the governments took stock of it. They realized that this is not sustainable. The country will be completely destroyed much worse than today, Sri Lanka or Pakistan or Venezuela, etc. Therefore, let's do something at least for the future. So for all the new recruits who are appointed after 2004, the governments decided that we will now have a contributory pension like in the other countries. The employer and employee will contribute and future pensions for these new recruits, the old recruits as until they draw pension at the end of their, the end of their life, the old pattern will continue because you can't go back on that. At least from now, we will transfer the burden concurrently, not to the future generation from the tax money. Every, all of you, many of you are uh, in audit and accounts and so on and so forth. It's, it's minimal prudence in management. And therefore, the national pension system was created. It is fully funded. Government of India is spending 14% is contributing towards the pension or the salary amount, in addition to salary. And the individual is giving 10%, states varying degrees, but 10, 10% generally. So a pension fund is now created under the national pension system. It's working well in the last 18 years, except West Bengal, every state accepted it, and it's working well. An impressive consensus was built. While it was started by NDA, UPA actually pushed it further, Dr. Manmohan Singh's government. It's working well. Suddenly, state after state for short-term political compulsions, because employees are organized, strong, vocal group, though they're only 3% of the total workers of the country, political parties are terrified of them. They're not bothered about the future of the country, what happens after five or 10 years. They're not afraid of the 97% of the rest of the population. This 3% because they're organized, they're worried because the rest of the population doesn't understand and therefore they will not vote according to this. Whereas the employees may vote is the fear. So they are now reverting after 18 years of successful application of national pension system, they revert into world pension system. Now, what will happen if this continues? Next slide. Already, you take from 2004-05 to 2021-22, in 17 years, the pension burden went up 11 times. It's not a, a normal 5-10% increase per year. 11 times increase in 17 years. X became 11X. 37,000 close became 4 lakh close. I want you to understand this. It's an exponential rise. Next, please. Okay, that is absolute amount. What, how is it as a ratio? Because after all, our GDP is growing, our tax realization is growing. 
Now, what's the big problem? It's a huge problem. This slide shows you the pension burden as a share of the state's own resources and as a share of the state's total revenues. As a share of own resources from 7.9% initially in 1991, economic reform started in 91, remember, it now grew three and a half times, 27.4% as a share of the revenues. Not only is it rising absolutely, it's rising as a share of the government revenues. Therefore, we are getting deeper and deeper into the hole. As a share of total revenues, from something like 5%, we have now come to 14.3%, pension alone, and it's rising. And if this continues, what will happen? We have some data, for instance, Andhra Pradesh has done a lot of detailed work, actuarial studies and all that. You can see the graph. After the total revenues, including government of India transfers, was stood at 11%, will be by 2050, 28.6% of the total revenues, including government of India transfers only on pension. It will rise to 40%. Typically, in a reasonably well-run government, 7% should be the pension burden. These numbers should really give us nightmares. Next, please. As a share of state's own revenues, they're already at 74%. They will rise to 130% by 2050, 129%. Next, please. Pension alone. I'm talking of pension alone. Imagine pension alone taking away all your taxes collected in the state. It is an extremely, and it's not a conjecture. It's absolutely going to be, except it's not happening today. It will happen tomorrow, day after tomorrow, next year, year after that. Fiscal deficit, the norm under FRBM law for the states is 3% of GSDP. Annual fiscal deficit, how much we're borrowing. Now they are maintaining 3 or 3.5 COVID this start. It will reach by 2050 8.1%. Absolutely unsustainable. 8.1% of the GSDP, please remember. And the total revenues of the state typically are about 8% GSD. State and union together, I told you, 19% is our tax GDP ratio. States typically collect 8%. That means the total tax revenue is going towards pension. As a consequence, obviously, as the debt is growing, today it's at, I told you, actually 42% from Andhra, for Andhra Pradesh, including the off budget thing. But even if you assume 38%, it's going to be 107%. The norm is 20%, remember. The state's debt limit is 20%. By 2050, it'll be 107%. By 2100, it'll be 211%. For the state alone, forget government of India. How is it looking in terms of per capita expenditure, the pensions? You know, if you take the pension for government employees, the per capita expenditure per year is 5,34,000 rupees. Whereas the poor people, they are complaining about you know, all kinds of uh, individual short-term welfare measures, but they pale into insignificance compared to this. Andhra Pradesh has the best pension scheme in the country in terms of the poor getting something, 2,750 rupees per month per pensioner. They get 27,000 rupees, those who get it, whereas from the tax money unfunded, whereas this money is concurrently spent, whereas tax money unfunded, we are paying 5,34,000 5, rupees on an average from the lowest employee to the rest. Now, how do we compare with the other countries? As I told you, other countries give pension to all workers, organized, unorganized, private sector, public sector, self-employed, from Bill Gates to an employee in government, to a policeman and fireman. Everybody is part of the pension system. And they contribute the money. And from that money, pensions are drawn. And there's always a surplus right now there's a $2 trillion plus pension fund in the U.S. Annually, they're spending about $1,000 billion, about a $1 trillion. If you look at these numbers, $70,000 or so is the per capita income. The per capita pension per annum that they get, Social Security after retirement, is about $17,000, about 24-25% of the GSTP per capita. Look at India. one lakh ninety two thousand rupees is a per capita income. One state, other states, you know, you can make your guesses, but roughly to the same order, five and a half lakh rupees is what we're paying, about almost three times the per capita income. So this is the problem. That's the reason why numbers are going completely out of uh, control. Uh, just to compare with US, UK, France, Sweden, and India, in all those countries fully funded through contributions of employer and employee, and from that pensions are paid, so there's no burden in the tax money. And full or near full population, US 94%, the balance 6%, most of them are 
Like servicemen have a separate thing, veterans thing, and some other things. But practically, the whole population is covered. UK and France and Sweden, etc., hundred percent covered, and they are all spending fifteen percent of their revenues on pension. But for hundred percent of the population, India also is spending fifteen percent of the revenues right now. But for three percent of the population, so what can be done? Luckily, we don't have to do much already. A the national pension system and the FRB Act create the framework. We just have to stick to them with some modifications as the situation warrants. And the constitution makers already made a provision because please remember, unlike some other countries in India, the states cannot go bankrupt. While for convenience sake, we talk about state and the union, etc. There's only general government debt. And the union government, the government of India is the guarantor of all the debt of India, Indian governments, and the guarantor of the credit of the union, credit of India. And recognizing that, the Constituent Assembly, after a great deal of debate, they incorporated several provisions, including Article 293 of the Constitution, by which every state, when they want to incur a debt, they must take the prior pillar of government of India. The reason is, ultimately, government of India is the guarantor. And the government of India has the duty to impose conditions for the larger fiscal health of the country under Article 293.4. Similarly, some of you might have heard provisions for financial emergency. The government can declare a financial emergency under Article 360. And then automatically all the budgetary control goes to government of India. All money will have to be approved by the government of India. And government of India has the power even to reduce the salaries and pensions and allowances. So these extraordinary provisions are deliberately created in the constitution itself, original constitution, because they understood what the problem is. We just have to implement. So here are some, there's a lot more detail, but I don't want to go into details. This is more, I think this is the last slide. The first is we must have a golden rule as many countries have. That means you do not borrow for the current expenditure. If you can go back to the slides, look at the slide, last slide. We do not borrow for the current expenditure. That means borrowings only go for new investment. That means the states and the union must maintain a revenue deficit of zero, no revenue deficit. It will not happen overnight, but over two, three years. Union also has a problem, except the union is generally more responsible, but because of some structural reasons, union also has a deficit. This year, for instance, the union government revenues are 27 lakh crores. Transfers to states, employees, salaries and pensions, and interest payments, they are far in excess of 27 lakh. There is a five or six lakh crore deficit only with these things, structural deficit. So the first rule is we must quickly come to revenue deficit zero. What you do within that is your business, but you cannot borrow without creating assets or without investing. The second is, if the states want to give better, more generous pensions, it's up to them. But they cannot postpone the liability to next generation. You now put that money in a pension fund on a discounted cash flow basis to meet the future pension payments. Otherwise, no government has a right to now declare something and without creating assets, create a burden on the next generation of tens of thousands or lakhs of crores or rupees of pension burden. That's what's happening in India for temporary political gain. And government of India is absolutely well within its duty and right to impose that condition under Article 293.4. And we also have to look at progressive increase in retirement age because in keeping with the overall lifespan increase, if we don't increase retirement age, A, we are not using very productive people with experience effectively. And B, the pension burden mounts for fewer years of service and increasingly governments are resulting to populism by increasing the recruitment age. Earlier they used to join at 28, 21 and government. Today, 28, 30, 33, you retire at a certain age and then lifespan is expanded. Therefore, pension index linked, unlimited liability. So instead of that, progressive increase the retirement age. Within these broad parameters, we can certainly sit with the employees in the states and the union and give them greater confidence because, you know, all right, how do we make sure that the money is not lost, that it's not invested in a very risky manner? How do I get freedom as an employee to decide where my money goes, how to invest it? All these are perfectly reasonable things and we can work out. But fundamentals to protect the country and its future, that we cannot borrow for current expenditure and that if you want to incur liabilities, you cannot transfer the liability to the future. You have to actually fund it today so that the cost of decisions is not concealed. 
Today, what's happening is catastrophic decisions are made for political gains, but the cost is concealed and borne later. Take away that incentive and increase retirement age. And this is, as I mentioned, the most important danger face in the country. Several states, West Bengal did not join this program, the only state that refused to join the NPS. And now many, many states, including Himachal Pradesh, Punjab, if you notice Himachal Pradesh and Punjab have very high debt and very high, obviously, if you remember the ratios and the graphs, they have the worst uh, fiscal picture. And yet they embrace the world pension system recklessly for political reasons. Himachal, Punjab, Rajasthan, um, Chhattisgarh, Jharkhand, now Karnataka. The latest is Karnataka. I hope they will come back. We are all trying very hard to persuade the government and the key functionaries that is destructive of the state. But the other day, to my horror, the new chief minister, Siddharamaya, who is a very professional man, he knows his finances, his finance minister several years, presented several budgets. But even he felt uh, compelled to give a public um, statement that he will give OPS, etc. So uh, unless we wake up, the rest of the 97% of the population are the enlightened government employees who want to protect the future. We certainly want the employees to have security after retirement, but not at the cost of the country. There is a country. There has to be fairness, equity, intergenerational equity. And unless we wake up, we realize that it's our battle. It's not somebody's private battle. I think we're in a mortal danger in, in a country where electoral success is all that matters, the future be damned. That's why I thought this very focused issue I wanted to bring to your attention with some data. There's a lot more data available. Actually, in the next few days, we're going to print a, a detailed booklet uh, a lot of uh, logic and uh, uh, evidence and also lots of uh, data, etc. And uh, I want all of you to please look at it. Raise your voice in whatever manner you can as citizens. It's, we are citizens and taxpayers. We have to protect our children's future. And if this country does not get this 6-7% growth rate in the next 20-30 years on a sustained basis, I really shudder to think of the future. I'm a great optimist. I'm one of the greatest optimists of this country in the past 30 years. But optimism does not mean romanticism. You must look at the realities, and when the reality is um, pretty distressing, we have to try and change that. And this is a modest effort in that direction. I will floor open to you. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you so much. This is uh, this is a rather a grim uh, discussion so far. When you have given the lowdown on public finances, the numbers appear to be very very alarming. The the debt burden, the borrowings by states both responsible, needed, and irresponsible, everything put together is resulting to what we call alarming numbers. The second aspect is another dangerous uh, potence or dangerous signals that we are getting is from the committed expenditure, which is rising as a percentage of our revenues. And that projections also we have seen, and that doesn't actually settle very well with us. And the third one is the skewed social security system and the fallouts of such skewed security systems in, some, in terms of pensions and the rising pension burden. Uh, the, towards the end of your presentation, you have told a very, very telling tale on the kind of burden that we will have to bear for now and also for the next few decades. Uh, it is important to create a security system for our people, but not at the cost of the country that we live in. Uh, that's a very, very strong uh, statement. And I'm sure the ground is now laid and is ready for the Q&A from among the distinguished participants that we have. So what we do is uh, we have two clusters of questions. The first cluster will be taken up by Professor Prasad and I will come back for the second cluster. During the second cluster, I will uh, see if the participants are raising hands and open the mic for them to directly ask the question with you. And more or less, we'll try and incorporate and accommodate as many questions as possible. Thank you so much, sir. I now request Professor Prasad to start cluster one. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, you have uh, given us many insights into what can happen if some of these measures which are taken up in certain states and which may have the danger of growing into many other states continue. And you have related it to the percentage of the GDP and in many cases to the percentage of per capita income also. So here comes the first question. The government, it, ap it appears the government will not have much money to spend on development from all this. Now, how does one connect it to economic growth, given that there is also a private sector? And how is there some relation here? And is there some black box, uh, you know, which kind of uh, can be manipulated to sort this out and is being projected? Uh, it's a straightforward equation. 
what happens when the government is forced to incur enormous and unsustainable debt? A, the lenders will then raise the interest rates because India as a country will not have credit ratings. The credit rating will fall. An interest rate globally, the market rates will go up and therefore for the same debt, your payment burden will increase. Therefore, you get into a debt trap. B, when you don't have enough money, but you're borrowing heavily, you crowd out the private sector. Private sector puts equity and also debt in order to invest in the country. So not only are you messing up your finances, you are guaranteeing that the private sector has no money to be able to invest adequately. C, infrastructure goes for a toss because you have no money to spend on in infrastructure. D, the social sector, quality of education and healthcare are critical for economic growth because they enhance productivity. Without educational skills, what kind of modern economy are you talking about? Already Indian education is one of the worst in the world. I didn't want to go into those details, but I'm sure some of you at least are familiar. While we, we award degrees like in a match factory, you know, all kinds of certificates, the quality of our degrees in the most part and quality of school certificates are absolutely useless because we have abysmally poor standards of education. Instead of improving that, we're actually guaranteeing that there's no time or attention or resources for that. And healthcare, we are one of the worst in the world in terms of spending and outcomes. And without these two, you cannot really enhance productivity in a modern economy and grow. And finally, once the situation is seen, no investor is going to come forward in the country. People run for very safe uh, investment propositions uh, and uh, they become risk covers. So growth will plummet. So there is a, a direct causal link. Excellent, sir. I think the, the points are very well laid out. Uh, increase in interest rates, then squeezing out uh, public sector borrowings, uh, investments in infrastructure, and then uh, under investments in social se sector infrastructure, which will uh, decrease the long term, the medium term as well as the long term productivity. I think the equation is very clear, sir. The next question, sir, uh, this is based on a comment slash question when audience persistence policies and integral value systems, is there a congruence for the political class? Now, in this, I want to ask a supplementary. How do politicians think and what are this, uh, what are the dangers uh, which are currently prevalent in this spreading across? I don't think it's a uniform approach. In the last 48 hours, for instance, I've spoken to some major political figures in a major political party, including former chief ministers and people of that stature, of major states. They're all very troubled, troubled by their own party stance. So within political parties also, there are many mature leaders who have had experience who understand what's happening. But our party structure being what it is, two things are happening. One is power at any cost. Let the future be done. That is prevailing. And two, within a party, there's so much of centralization. There's actually no consultation. There's no debate and discussion. If there's debate and discussion, there'll be other voices within the parties to, to say, look, you know, today we may win or something, but tomorrow there'll be a danger. We can't handle it. Unfortunately, those voices are getting silenced. I still have faith in the political process. If we raise voice, if we make them realize that if they look for this 2 3% vote, first of all, that vote is not homogenous. Even government employees, they don't vote blindly to one party or other. And secondly, even if a significant number of them are willing to vote for one party because of this one issue, if the rest of the people wake up to some extent, the political parties realize not only the long-term economic cost, but the short-term political cost. That there are many taxpayers, there are 10, 12 crore taxpayers, and they are waking up. They understand if we want to pamper, pamper one group at the cost of the rest of the country, we will pay electoral. So I believe it's not a, uh, it's not a hopeless case. It's not easy. It's never easy when the clash is between the powerful organized sectors who understand what is at stake versus the powerless and by and large ignorant unorganized sector who don't really understand what is at stake. That is the fight. It's, that's why politics sometimes is so difficult. Those who want to protect the long term have a short term battle on their hands. But if that battle is not fought and won, then there is no nation building, any nation. If you always yield to the short term and a few minority stakeholders who have the voice and who have self-interest, then the country is doomed. Thank you, sir. You have laid out some of the challenges which are there within uh, political parties. Politicians get to decide in India. They have advisors. They are well aware of economic prudence. 
and from one of our uh, last webinars where we had Mr. Anil Swaroop. So he was saying that if you explain to politicians in a political way that they are going to lose because of this, then they generally tend to understand. Now, given all this, how do you execute what you said? So in summary, you said if you wake up the 97% and you get the politician focus on the 97%, perhaps this can be controlled. So what are the action steps which can be laid out in this? Sir? No, first, let's remember, who are the people who brought the national pension system? Even I was not aware, frankly, of what was happening. Mr. Vajpayee brought it. He was in a minority government. So there is still enlightenment left in political process. And who was the person who actually expanded it to the country and then aggressively pushed it forward? Dr. Manmohan Singh did it. Both the major parties. So already there is a significant proportion of political leadership which understands and you must trust them because they are the ones who brought it. Second, look at a state like Orissa. It's a relatively poor state, right? But look at fiscal management of Orissa. They are politically popular. The state is actually improving. You look at the population figures, fertility rates, and education, healthcare, innovations, power sector reforms, Orissa is in the forefront, and the fiscal management is a model. So you have to demonstrate that political popularity, state's economic growth, and stability, and prudent fiscal policies, they can go together. One is not at the cost of the other. And what we propose to do is, right now, we put, it, put together what is available, and then we are printing a, a detailed booklet. We are going to go to every single forum which is possible. We are going to form an alliance of like-minded people who are above parties and partisanship. We are going to have a national roundtable with some of the most prominent Indians. I don't want to name names, but very soon you'll get to know the names. Some of the most prominent Indians in political spectrum and economic spectrum uh, and constitutional offices, many people, those who are in constitutional office and uh, have a collective voice then an alliance of organizations will reach out to every single major political party and also parliamentary committee on finances. Already have reached out to the finance minister of India, the economic advisory council, the chief economic advisor, and several states, the chief ministers, as well as the political parties, etc. And you have to build a momentum ultimately. But if it's merely a voice of a few people, mere logic and uh, evidence, while they're necessary, they're not sufficient. If there is a bus created, if more and more people are talking about it, because this is the truth, you can verify the numbers. Whatever I gave, everything is verifiable. You should not take anything that I say at face value. And even the states which are going for that, they have no defense. They're not even arguing why it is necessary. And therefore, with the evidence and logic on our side, and we are also looking at a credible set of solutions. Government of India already appointed a committee headed by the finance secretary, and they're trying to come up with a model, you know, which sort of you know, meets the, some of the concerns of the employees. At the same time, protest the fiscal future. That's the right approach. Because you have to have a consensus. Employees are not our enemies. They are part of us. And they're not doing anything wrong. After all, if government is willing to give you something over and above what you deserve, why not take it? You're not doing anything illegal. Suppose the government gives you or me one lakh rupees a month. Will we say no to that? Is their stupidity. So here, it's not the... Employees, that are the problem. It is the government's political weakness and pusillanimity, various governments. But even then, quite a few governments are standing from Andhra Pradesh, Telangana. I'm not talking of party politics. Uh, or you take uh, uh, Odisha, as I mentioned to you, Uttar Pradesh, uh, and many other states, they're standing from. So we have to simply uh, reach out to the political system and out of the 97%, if at least 10%, understand a little bit and some buzz is created. I'm pretty confident that the momentum is in favor of fiscal prudence because everybody understands. Don't underestimate politicians understand. They do understand, but they're just scared. It's like examination going students. They're saying, well, we'll see later tomorrow, but no, now we have to somehow protect ourselves. That is it. Very good, sir. I think uh, we are talking about some momentum getting generated and uh... Uh, we come to the other point. I mean, the next two years are crucial. This year and next year, number of uh, uh, absolutely. governments uh, absolutely. Number of governments are going for elections and the central government election is also there. So uh, to what extent the momentum will, one will go ahead of the other is under question. So in this context, how do you, what do you do about citizens? I mean, some want freebies because they're getting it and some want growth. So what action can be done during this period for citizens so that there is some kind of word of mouth there and some kind of understanding there. No, I want us to have some clarity about 
what you mentioned freebies actually i would call them uh, individual short term welfare measures because even the richest countries they do offer individual short term welfare because in a democracy unless you carry the people across the board with you if you merely take an economic view of the long term always there's a political price to pay it's a fact even in united states they gave a loan waiver to students they put a lot of money into people's pockets and that's the cause of inflation globally right now for instance so that's inevitable i don't think the issue is freebies versus no freebies i, I think the issue is about a realistic balance between short term welfare measures and long term growth and investment how to reconcile them in a more harmonious way i think we are well past the stage when we can say i will put every all money into only growth a government that says that a party that says that will lose deposits everywhere so it's more about a balance and the second is the isws the individual social welfare measures even if sometimes they are costly they are really not on par with uh, the uh, old pension system right a you can withdraw them any time you want. if a government has the political will or if there is a fiscal crisis you can say sorry i can no longer give you this free because there is no long term legal liability b they are reaching a large number of the people they are not reaching 3% of the people they are reaching 60 70% of the people after all if tax money is going to remove some of the burden of the poor we cannot put it on the same platform the same plane as this kind of a, a small group getting disproportionate benefit c as long as growth momentum is maintained if 6 7% growth is there with inflation another 4 5% we are going to get 12 13 14% increase in revenues annually if you at least freeze the current expenditure on these short term welfare measures if you have that much of discipline don't have to reduce within 3 4 years it will become manageable so first in our minds we have to distinguish these two and we have to also recognize that a country like india cannot politically survive as a democracy unless you do give the the, the poor people the the short term relief also but a balance is what i'm seeking a sustainable balance if you take a doctrinal approach that is doomed to failure excellent sir i'll slightly modify my question i think the word came from what the audience question was uh, we have seen some of these you know welfare schemes in the recent election in canada uh, karnataka and there are also the cause for perhaps why they won and uh, perhaps you know the kind of disparity which is there between uh, people with sectors which are getting well off and uh, areas which are not so there is a logic in it so we'll 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 keep that uh, point as something which is needed however still with respect to what has been spoken about how do you energize citizens to start thinking in that manner so that there's an adequate momentum before they vote apart from what is done with political parties that's exactly what this this this, this small group meeting is one part of it okay there will be a lot more because now luckily with social media and digital technology and so on and so forth if the message is strong enough and truthful enough and urgent enough and if all of us pool our resources together and innovation together i think we can go viral very quickly once people understand how significant this is now most of our public discourse is dominated by you know some dramatic political events you no know, patna political meeting prime minister's visit to united states or the submarine has uh, unfortunately that uh, implosion five people died no they capture disproportionate attention but the real issues that affect the future of hundreds of millions of people are not capturing enough attention if you at least capture some attention and use our collective resources and strength and people like me can uh, or groups like ours can give you the data the logic and find innovative solutions and then try and see the advocacy part of it no because of the credibility and access to many people but in reaching to ordinary people an issue as complex as this which is not amenable to yes or no and some dramatic thing a lot of us must pool our resources that's why i'm reaching out to everybody today i could have spoken about governance reform of india and constitution of india but i thought deliberately i would use this opportunity to talk to people all over the country increasingly of these facts because right now in my mind this is the most imminent danger if this is not addressed all our tall talk about india and the constitution it goes on for excellent sir so you have laid out three points one is the you know how to get to digital uh going viral and then you know uh, influencers influencers who can trigger both of this thank you sir uh, we come to the end of this cluster i hand it uh, back to professor rao some more questions are there but i think they have been answered in your presentation as well as your responses to the answers
Excellent. Thank you very much, sir. From the, from the way I gather and understand, uh, there is a greater need for us to talk about this in as many fora as possible. Absolutely. And we seem to be really blessed to have this opportunity with you today to talk about us, even before the booklet is published. Uh, that way, as an institution and as a platform, we feel that uh, we have uh, touched this one rather early. Uh, in, in, in the whole context, it's not early actually, but in terms of the discussions uh, to create awareness, yes it is. I also want to take a moment and uh, acknowledge the fact that some of the distinguished people who have joined today are from, uh, they themselves are from various uh, institutions, uh, uh, academics, uh, some of them from US and all cities, uh, distinguished soldiers uh, we have. And uh, Professor Mahinder Reddy has joined us. Uh, he was our uh, former vice chancellor and distinguished advisor currently. I, know. Uh, I welcome all of them uh, to this uh, wonderful conversation and I'll com um, completely dedicate time to taking the questions from the audience. Just before that, I'll raise myself one and then go to Kritik. Uh, sir, what measures uh, do you think we should take in education and job creation that are likely to fuel countries' economic growth? I wish I had an easy answer. It is perhaps the most important question, not only from India's point of view, given India's size and complexity, it's a it's a, it's a global challenge. How do you employ the hundreds of millions of Indians in productive and uh, relatively secure jobs? Without going into some wishful thinking, what is it that we can do as Indian state? A, infrastructure. B, skills. Our education, I briefly mentioned in passing, I'm sure you're all familiar. We are one of the least educated people on planet Earth, notwithstanding the impression we try to create globally or the self-image some of us have. If our people are still dominating some multinationals and some sectors, it's despite our education system and because of a vast number, so even a small proportion would came out of this rut, they're able to make an impact in terms of numbers. But the reality is, I'm sorry to have to state this, I'm a great optimist as I said, but I never ignore realities. In survey after survey, there's actually a life skills survey conducted by Pratham Group in 2018, you know what it says? 50% of the youngsters in India, 40 to 50% depending on the region and state, but roughly in that margin, between the ages of 14 and 18, cannot look at a watch and read time. About 75, 80% can tell you roughly now the time is about seven o'clock something. But only 50% are able to tell you it is now seven hours, 22 minutes or something. In the 21st century, between 14 and 18, a vast proportion of Indians cannot read time. They cannot put weights to, to, to weigh, let us say, two kilograms of prinjol. They don't know what weights to put to, to weigh two kilograms of prinjol. They cannot count currency notes. How much? I want to pick out 265 rupees. Please pick out that money. A large number cannot pick out. We have abysmally poor quality skills. It's not merely... 10th class and classrooms and toilets and buildings, all that is necessary. But outcomes are appallingly bad. And colleges are not much better. Let me be able to hand it. It is sad, except some of the good ones like your institution and many others are trying very hard. But these fall in the 10, 15, 20% category. 80% are perfunctory, either mass copying or rote learning and perfunctory degrees without any understanding of what they're doing, without conceptual understanding or ability to actually use that knowledge productively, or exposure to the realities of Indian conditions to be problem solvers. But the good news is the demand side is very strong in India for education and skills, except that we have not defined success in education and we have not measured it honestly and intelligently. If you just do these two things, define the outcomes, the success, Instead of the stupid 99% marks or 50, 80% marks and pass and so on and so forth, you actually define the outcomes much more rigorously and measure them much more honestly and intelligently without too much pressure because it's about conceptual understanding and problem solving rather than rote learning and memory-based learning. I'm betting the vast demand for quality education in India, the hunger, will manifest itself with positive. Today it's manifesting negative. Is my child getting 99% mark? Is my child getting a rank? They're not looking at, is my child getting good education, good understanding, good ability to actually do things? We're not looking at that because we everything is made in terms of how many marks, what is the cutoff mark, 99%. Nowhere in the world do you have 10th grade kids 
or intermediate kids getting 990 marks out of 1,000 and hundreds of them getting it. Most of them know nothing about anything. So there are ways of doing it. There are a lot of things, but the central issue to my mind is this hunger for education must be translated to meaningful demand, rational demand, defining success sensibly, measuring it honestly and intelligently. It's not enough to intelligently measure because now we're too far gone. There's so much of mass copying. You must also design mechanisms to honestly measure it. Once you do that, and that applies to education and skills together, rest of it, no, because Indians want to succeed. And there are so many opportunities in the market. The private sector, the society at large, and the families will take over. But without doing that, I don't see how we're going to create employment. Of course, meanwhile, to promote economic growth in order to create jobs, we have to do whatever it takes. And some effort is now being made. We simply have to accelerate it without messing up public finances. That's why it's so important to protect public finances. Without infrastructure, without investment, some incentives for investment promotion uh, and skill promotion, there's no way we can create employment for the hundreds of millions of people. We have seen that we haven't seen nothing yet. Only 30% are urban today, and 70% are in villages with very low level of skills, and desperately looking to move to cities without any skills, alienation, unemployment, underemployment, impersonal lives, therefore crime, anarchy. We're going to see tremendous challenges in the coming years unless we set our house in order. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much uh, for that big takeaway. Uh, the crux or the core of the point that you mentioned is that define the outcomes of success uh, honestly and have mechanism to measure it very objectively and uh, very sincerely, uh, apart from creating the learning infrastructure and the skills that are needed for 21st century. Amazing point, sir. Thank you very much. Uh, I'll now request uh, Kritik to uh, raise uh, his question. Okay, first off, thank you, Mr. Sabaparao, and thank you, Mr. Jayaprakash Narayan, for allowing me to answer my questions. And I do agree with you on the point about a higher demand for quality education here in India. There has been a large surge in online learning platforms, entrepreneurship schools, private schools, and many other learning platforms alongside certificates for those courses. Which, would, which many Indians would like to see as beneficial, especially for high schoolers who are trying to apply to colleges. My question is something different. Across the world, there has been decreasing birth rates as well as decreasing death rates in, thanks to advances in medical technology. My question is how this rising demographic in the elderly population would impact the economy of places such as India with a higher per impact, a higher cons demand, sorry, for pension as well as reduced number in the workforce. You're right. Well, India does not yet face that kind of a demographic crisis of aging population, but already our birth rates have considerably come down. India's fertility rate is now below replacement level. As you know, if a mother during a reproductive age has 2.1 children, then there's a replacement level. Greater than that, population continues to increase. Less than that, after some time, population will continue to decline. India is already at two. It's very soon going to be 1.8, 1.7. Many states, including Andhra Pradesh, Telangana, even a state like Odisha, Karnataka, Kerala, Maharashtra, they're all, even West Bengal, they're all at 1.6, 1.7 already. So while it takes some time, within the next 20, 30 years, we'll have fewer working age people and fewer children already actually, our notion of education, school education, for instance, is very flawed. We're thinking of more and more children, more and more schools and more and more teachers. No, the actual child population going to schools is already decreasing, decreasing in India, except in a couple of big states. Already there are fewer children of school going age today than compared to 10 years ago. We're not factoring that. We're still talking about employing more teachers rather than putting the teachers to better use. So already, because India is bigger than Europe and therefore, we, we tend to think of it as one homogeneous country, but there's vast diversity. But at this point of time, luckily for us, our challenge is how to put our working age population to productive use, not worry about where are the working age people. But because we haven't really imparted skills and productivity to them, the demographic dividend we're hoping for, as some people have commented, is potentially going to be a demographic nightmare, but it's not too late because we have a strong family system. That's actually our enduring base across religion and caste and region. The one common factor is our families really are devoted to each other and the parents are willing to sacrifice anything for their children. As long as that is retained 
And as long as that hunger to succeed is intrinsic in our families, if the state does a few sensible things and private sector responds sensibly to market demand, I think we can overcome these monumental challenges. Challenges are monumental, but they're not intractable. They're not impossible to overcome, but we, we have a, a huge task ahead of us. Great, thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Uh, yes, thank you very much. That very clearly answered my question. Before I request uh, Mr. Prasad Rao, I, I have one question myself to raise. Sir, uh, how to strengthen rural economy uh, beyond primary sectors to improve national economic growth? One, there are many things we need to do. I don't want to go into that, but two, two big, big items in my judgment. You cannot have agriculture with a long and inefficient supply chain adding value or improving incomes. We have to compress the market chain. We need private sector to have the incentives to invest hundreds of billions of dollars in the supply chain in, in grading, packaging, transport, storage, processing, retailing. If all are handled by supply chain, the compressed supply chains and the retail chains, what will happen is the realizable market value for the producer will be 60 to 70 percent of the end price. In India, typically it is 25 to 30 percent. Not because anybody is fleecing them, but because the inefficient supply chain, you know, the, 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 the hardworking uh, vegetable vendor in KBR Park from whom I buy, my wife buys every morning fruits and vegetables, she's not making tons of money. She's just selling 20, 30 kgs that day. She wakes up four o'clock in the morning. And I don't know how she manages, then she goes to the um, wholesale market, uh, transport and all that, then buy stuff, and then again transports it to KBR Park, and half the time it's closed or shut down, VIP comes, there is rainfall or something else, and then sells the 20, 30 kgs. Unless she makes five, 600 rupees on the 20, 30 kgs, she cannot survive. So it's not so that, that some somebody, some intermediary is taking your money, it's just the inefficient market chain. Once you compress the market chain, and two, go for value addition, India has 11% of the global agricultural land. While our land mass is only 2.5% of the world's land, agriculturally, we are very rich. Once the productivity is unleashed, the market price is available and value addition is there, India will have a significant place in global markets. We'll have at least another $100 billion global agricultural exports possible. Only the big chains can actually penetrate those markets over time in the phytosanitary measures, maintaining the standards and penetrating the markets. The second big takeaway item, and there are many things I don't want to go into that, they are normally talked about. The second thing is, if we do not reimagine urbanization in India and create a model of in-situ urbanization, while big cities and cluster effect are required, if our imagination of urbanization is as a low-skill, poor villager must travel hundreds of kilometers and go to a big city without a social support system, with alienation, with low level of skills, no housing, you have seen what happened during the COVID crisis when the lockdown happened and hundreds of millions of people suffered grievously. It's feared in our, into our memory. I'm not saying big cities should not grow, but they must not be the only urban pockets. There must be small towns that should be the growth centers for the low level skills. If you're a carpenter or a plumber, you don't have to go to Delhi or Chennai or Hyderabad. Where people are, your work is there. Relatively low skills can be engaged and occupied there. The higher skills, obviously, you have to go to big cities. Once you do that, there is a synergy between the village economy and the small towns in the neighborhood. There is no alienation socially. Agriculture, non-agriculture seamlessly are fused. And there will be tremendous growth and opportunity for the bulk of the ordinary poor people at the low-level skills. This, along with a tremendous fill-up to um, employment generation sectors, like, for instance, you know, garments, China exports $323 billion of garments and textiles. We produce as much cotton. We are poorer than, much poorer than China. We export $41 billion. China also does the high-end stuff, from electric cost to 100 other things. But China never ignored the labor-intensive sectors. We have completely we messed up our labor laws and many other things. Therefore, in all of India, there are just two or three companies which are engaging 15, 20,000 people in garments, for instance. Or leather, we are the largest producers of leather in the world, but we are not really adding value there. We are not creating employment. So, as you trust, 
and employment generation with low skills with rural urban linkages in small towns i think that is the way forward we have to reimagine development model if we have to absorb the hundreds of millions of villages into the economy and society and politics very very pertinent uh, takeaway sir thank you so much uh, for that the two big uh, points that you mentioned for boosting up rural economy is or the contribution of rural to the overall uh, economic growth is to compress the market share make it more efficient on the other hand actually reimagine the urbanization act strengthening smaller towns as growth centers as opposed to the conventional off beaten track of urbanization which is quite skewed uh, thank you sir i'll quickly move uh, to mr prasad rao garu uh, to raise his uh, question sir sir good evening sir good evening sir i am education of uh, miracle uh, education society group of institutions sir mm -hmm. uh, working as a student professor sir all we know that uh, we have uh, three sectors in our economy one is primary and secondary and territory sector but we know that uh, most of the people depends upon uh, primary sector that is agriculture but unfortunately we got uh, uh, more gdp from uh, service sector that is territory sector uh, can i know what is the reason behind it you know this is an inevitable part of modernization in the 20th and 21st centuries world over for 10000 years mankind's obsession is to feed itself and maybe it'll okay. clothe itself everything is related to agriculture primary production but modernization necessarily meant a on the one hand we created the ability to feed ourselves reasonably well so even a country like okay. india way back in 70s until that time we were living ship to mouth so our ability to feed ourselves is reasonably assured with modern technology and our needs grew beyond our basic needs no 50 years ago when i was growing up in a village 60 years ago i grew up in a village your needs are very minimal bare survival was adequate today nobody wants that you want a mobile phone you want nice clothes you want computers you want all the good things where do they come from they don't come from primary uh, without okay, primary so primary production is important for survival once survival needs are met human yes, desires sir. human wants human economic activity human ambitions aspirations mean you grow into secondary and tertiary sector inevitably so this is not something that you can reverse easily what you can do is can you add value to primary sector can you yes, engage sir. people more productively and if that sector is not able to employ the hundreds of millions of people can you then move them into the small towns and then integrate primary and secondary and tertiary sectors and you have an integrated economy there is no way you can bring people back to agriculture in large numbers anywhere in the world because one of the iron laws of modern economics is fewer and fewer people are able to produce more and more goods you like it or not not in agriculture even manufacturing ultimately only about 200 million people are producing most of the goods for the 8 billion population in the world so service sector is inevitably going to grow but india is much more skewed because we messed up our manufacturing very badly we messed up our agricultural yes, value addition very badly and therefore either we have primary sector or we have tertiary sector very little in between we have yes, to become a little more like malaysia where there's a yes. more balanced thing and integrate them all we should not treat them in isolation but actually without uh, primary sector there is no secondary and tertiary sector no no who is arguing that here we have so responsible to promote the primary sector i mean the primary it's sector become emotional and romantic primary sector is vital without food yes, you can't yes, survive yes, sir. Right, once sir. food is assured you are not content with that are you and i are we going to sir go all we know that most of the people depends upon primary sector sir in india so why are uh, we are neglecting that particular sector sir no that's what we are discussing how do we now create opportunities uh, uh, if you want to get uh, economic growth and development then we have to uh, promote our primary sector sir that is our primary responsibility i think that <laughs> no our end goal is the same but if you think that you can take all these people into the primary sector it simply is not feasible no no we are we are only going to iteration see fewer and fewer people produce more and more that is what modern technology is about therefore how do you go to value addition and give productive employment how do you look back like old fashioned hindi or telugu films and say you must stick to the village you must only do agriculture if you do anything else you are a bad fellow this is all 70 year old notion is there any villager who wants to stay in the village show me a young person how many people want to stay in the village voluntarily yes sir, so, yes, sir. you are right but you cannot order people to stay in the village and do agriculture 
not when there is no income and productivity. Yes, to enhance productivity and incomes there, we have to do other things so that we get a harmonious development and people's desires and needs are fulfilled. But here, I, what I want to say that without primary sector, there is no... That is obvious. There is the question, yes. without food, how will we survive? But we have enough yes, food. Yes. It, is, it is not possible. It is not possible. What I want to say that here... Prasad Raghur. Here, Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Prasad Raghur, thank you very yes. much for your question. You, you made your point. Uh, sir, uh, in the interest of time, uh, I would also uh, quickly request uh, other members who would like to ask questions directly and keep it very short. Uh, Mr. Chaudhary Garu, would you like to raise your question? You are keyed in a lot. I think if you raise it yourself, it will be much better. And also, Dr. Lakshman, please raise your question. Yes, sir. Thank you very much, Dr. Sir. sir uh, hi, Jay Patel, sir. Thank you very much uh, for letting me to speak, uh, you know, ask questions, sir. Sir, I have two questions. For, uh, I'll quickly come to the first question. Sir, um, most of the, we have, we are the youngest, uh, youngest um, nation in the world. And with currently, the social media, in the, you know, the short videos, and every, everything is dominating the youth mindset. Right, so everybody is falling, as you said. Everybody, eighty percent of the people in India, you know, all the students would copy, copying and coming out of it. Twenty percent will not. Those twenty percent will not will not look at the YouTube's or Facebook and Instagram and all those videos which will which will waste their time, right? So the remaining fifty to eighty percent of the people would watch a lot, right? So my question is, sir. Why can't, uh, you know, you explain at the time of your presentation, you explain with uh, everything, all the problems in our country, in our state with numbers, right? Sir, why can't we, why can't we penetrate into that, into that shots or into the YouTube videos or Instagram or Facebook with these kind of numbers? Uh, you no, know, we're definitely a short, a group of short cluster of people would definitely uh, get impacted with these kind of actual numbers sir uh, you are you are a huge fighter uh, sir as far as my knowledge concerns sir as an is officer you will stick to uh, whatever you trust whatever the consequences may happen why can't we take uh, it's a kind of uh, eager eager uh, uh, thing sir uh, understanding so why can't we think in that in that way to uh, you know take these kind of things? If yes, if you trust this one, do we have any plans or what kind of suggestion you give to uh, we kind of people that thinking in in this particular way, sir? No, I, I agree with you. We have to go and reach out to as many people as possible in a very simple language. See, the more complex a message is, the more difficult it is to penetrate anywhere in the world. A, attention spans are limited. B, more attractive, exciting things are happening all the time. Which film is being released? Which film star is moving with whom? Which politician is meeting whom? You know, these are all more exciting things. Whereas India's GDP, our debt and our future are very boring things all over the world. So we have to have the capacity. Not everybody has that. Some people have that. And we have to find those people and appeal to their, uh, their wisdom and their support to see that it penetrates the minds of the people. Uh, there's no question, but it's it's not as easy as you as you're trying to say or as I'm trying to say. World over, to focus on the really important long-term things is an incredibly difficult thing. Global media, national media, local media, they're not that different. All over the world, this is the curse of humanity. So we have to consistently do that, and I guarantee you, no matter what happens, we will accomplish success here. We have to have plan A, we have to have plan B. If the states do not roll back, then we have to use the constitutional powers of the union and we must force the union to do that so that at least the, the, cost, the cost of catastrophic economic decisions is borne today so that the political and economic cost is faced by the same generation. Then the politics will change and the future will be saved. So there are several things we have to do. So in our repertoire, there must be many, many uh, weapons. You cannot depend on only one weapon. You must use it depending on the context. So we will do whatever it takes. I am at this point of time deeply concerned about this. There are a thousand things that bother me, but this is the most important thing given it's uh, the reasons we stated. And if you don't safeguard India from this, I don't think there's any future left. Therefore, I'm certain we will achieve success, but we have to do it collectively 
and it requires a lot of effort, a lot of people on a continuing basis until we achieve our success. Thank you, Thank you very much, sir. Yeah, please let me allow to ask one more question, sir, in terms of agriculture. Uh, uh, I'll quickly finish in a minute, sir. Um, so with respect to the agriculture, and uh, these days we have seen videos like, you know, people are people are ev uh, evacuating or not evacuating, sir. Uh, people are going out of the towns. The, all the youth is going out of uh, the villages. And if, if, this, if this situation occurs all the time, sir, continuing for the next decade, and who will who will who you know uh, for, to develop the agriculture and to get the outcome from the agriculture, and where can we find the farmers, sir? Uh, am I in the right way, or if yes, what kind of suggestion would you, would you give to the government uh, to? Uh, to no, that's the wrong question to ask. You see, if indeed there is a shortage of farmers, and therefore we require more people to work in agriculture then the society will reward them with greater price and greater incomes. The fact that in the long-term trajectory, the primary commodity prices are decreasing, if we take the real prices, adjusting for pricing for inflation, it shows that globally, humankind, rightly or wrongly, whatever the model we have chosen collectively, have created a system where the primary production continues to increase at lower and lower costs. Therefore, even after Russia's war in Ukraine, there were so many fears, my God, what will happen to food grains? You know, hundreds of millions will starve. Nothing of the kind happened. Even monsoon failure in India, you know, already two, three weeks delayed, it, the same thing 30, 40 years ago, we used to panic and central committees would come, relief teams would come, drought relief, year over. But today we're not panicking because we have learned to deal with all these things within reasonable limits. If an unprecedented catastrophe happens, I don't know what's going to happen. If a meteor hits planet Earth. Otherwise, primary production-wise, mankind or humankind has reached a level of self-sufficiency where there is no immediate danger. So that is not the problem. The problem is, what about these people's lives and livelihoods? If they leave the village and get a good livelihood in a city and decent life, I'm quite happy. My concern is they're not getting it. See, the people of India or the agriculturists of India, they was nothing. We are expecting them to be romantic and stay in the villages because they want to feed us. No, they want to feed themselves. They want to take care of themselves. They have their dreams, their aspirations. If indeed primary production is in danger, let's pay more and people will stay there and then produce that. They'll get incomes. Without incomes, they're asking them to stay there in agriculture or to romanticism is not going to help us anywhere, and it's a bad argument. People are not listening to you. So the challenge now is how do you create productive and dignified employment with decent incomes and livelihoods and opportunities for the bulk of these people? That means skills, that means economic growth, that means infrastructure, that means urban rural linkages, that means value addition. There's no one answer. You have to combine all this systematically. Thanks for correcting me, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir, for your patient response. Uh, uh, I have uh, I have requested the others to ask the question, but in the meantime, I request Professor Prasad if he has any question to come back in, and then we'll go back to them when they are ready. I think all the questions which have uh, come up have been responded in one way or the other. Excellent. Excellent. Uh, the, the other questions that we, there is a very interesting uh, suggestion that has been given by Chaudhary Garu. Uh, I'll just read that out. He was not able to ask the question himself, sir. Government has campaigned for giving up a gas subsidy and some people have opted for, for it. Similarly, the government should campaign for giving up of uh, the OPS uh, so that uh, some of them will opt for it and then it will go in the right direction. Your comments on this, sir. It's unrealistic. You see, gas is different. It's a small price. And you can provoke a sense of patriotism in them and say, look, you know, what do I get out of it? We'll do it. And it's verifiable. Whereas the pension benefits that are given in a disproportionate system, skewed pension system, as you said, are so great because it's index linked. People who are retired with 10,000 rupees salary are getting 70 to 80,000 rupees pension. Do you know that? So if you expect them to give up 70, 80,000 rupees, an average of six, six, six lakh rupees per year per employee. It's a huge amount for India. Please remember that. In purchasing power terms, 
even that small income, if you actually take the purchasing power parity, that comes to about um, $30,000, $40,000 per year. It's a lot of money, particularly in a poor country. So to expect that that will happen as a movement is unrealistic. I don't want to go into autobiographical stories, but you know, when government offered house sites, how many IAS officers said no? A site worth about a few crores of rupees. Did they say no? So don't expect charity and individual sacrifice to be the basis of good public policy. You would have a sound public policy and incentives, not charity and individual sacrifice. The state system is about creating a system that delivers rather than expecting people to work against their own self-interest. Great, sir. Thank you very much. Charity and individual sacrifice cannot form the basis for our economic policy making. Yeah, that's very. Uh, I have seen uh, Ms. Samina Janani uh, wanting to ask the question. Over to you, Samina. Hello. Good morning, sir. Hello. So I'm very thankful, sir. Jay Prakash Narin, sir. Directly, I'm talking. Uh, sir, uh, when I observe in this Telangana state uh, economical policy, what do you feel, sir, whether it's going in the correct way or not? See, they were done two things right. One is, before the formation of Telangana, for political reasons, there was a lot of schism, friction created between the indigenous Telangana people, there's nothing like that, but for reasons of convenience, let me state that, and the people who are, whose parents have migrated from other parts of Telugu regions. The government has acted very wisely after the formation of Telangana. They removed that distinction in their minds of the people, and that's the right way forward. The second is the good work done by earlier governments in terms of protecting the future of Hyderabad city infrastructure, investment, etc. That has been continued. These two are good things. But the negative is for the state with the largest surplus estimated by the 14th Finance Commission, Hyderabad. Telangana has the largest surplus estimated by 1,16,000 crores during the 14th Finance Commission period, the highest surplus in the country. All the surplus is wiped out, partly because of short-term individual welfare schemes, but that's not the real thing. Even the so-called capital investments, while well, I said capital investments are necessary, if there's no cost-benefit analysis in the name of capital investment, you spend humongous sums without any commensurate benefit, then the state is burdened with a long-term debt. There's an illusion of some great capital investment and asset creation. I have been singularly fighting against uh, the very high cost irrigation. I am one of the greatest champions of irrigation in India. Single-handedly, I brought lakhs of acres of irrigation. He's been an ordinary public official at a very low cost. I'm all for it. But spending three, four lakhs per acre capital investment and spending 30 to 40,000 per acre per year it cannot be justified whatsoever economically. So once you take up high cost programs like this out of romanticism or other motives, then the state gets into a difficult condition because Hyderabad is a big city, one of the engines of economic growth in India. And Telangana is relatively a small state and Hyderabad occupies population wise about 30, 35%, 35%. Economy wise maybe about 80%. Telangana doesn't have any long-term problem, but certainly there is a loss. See, I may survive, but I will not thrive as well as I should. Already there are reports that no, salaries and pensions are delayed every month. Every, almost every other day, uh, they're uh, indulging in overdrafts with RBI and the banks. A state like Telangana with this resource base should be in a much more comfortable position. So there are good things, there are not so good things. But on the whole, there is a certain desire to promote investment and economic growth and we should welcome it. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much, sir, for that uh, question. There's, there's another interesting question asked by one of the participants. Uh, we'll probably keep this as the last from this side. Uh, what are the top one or two electoral reforms that you would recommend for, the, for our country? The two most important things are, one, political parties' internal democracy. Genuinely, the leadership elected by the members through secret ballot the choice of candidates made by members or their representatives through secret ballot so that genuine democracy actually prevails and so on and so forth, funding and transparency so on and so forth. And an even more important reform is, you, you see what's happening in Telangana, Andhra Pradesh, many other states. You know, for those of you who 
you all know how much money is spent in elections in Telangana or in Karnataka, for instance. In the recent election, each constituency and MLA candidate typically spent 25 to 30 crores in one of the poorest countries on earth. In Telangana, in the recent by-elections in Hujarabad and later, uh, the Nalgonda district, what is the other one? Munugodu. You know how much money they spent? In Munugodu, they are estimated to have spent about 350 crores. In Hujarabad, they spent about 250 crores. You know, in each of these by-elections, in one assembly by-election in a relatively small state of India in a poor country, the total amount spent by the candidates is greater than the two major parties in Britain and the whole country's parliamentary election. And the 1,300 candidates are the two parties in all the parliament seats in 2019 election. I made an extremely strong statement. It's mind-boggling that one of the poorest countries on earth, one assembly segment in a small state, cost more than the total election contest cost of two major parties and all their candidates in the whole national parliamentary election in Britain. It's an incredible statement. We are so absurd. Now, this cannot be now changed by entreaties and moral speeches. It's too far gone because if a candidate or a party says, I will not distribute money, they will lose the deposits. We come to that stage. Therefore, you have to change the electoral system now. If you want to save India and Indian politics, you have to move towards a system where your distribution of money will not give you any additional advantage. And one of the surest ways of doing that is an improved. There are many details. I don't want to go into them. We have to tweak the system to suit our conditions. But basically, the seats allocated to parties based on the proportion of votes it gets, not a strong man somehow distributing money and getting one more vote than the other fellow. From the first pass the post system, we have moved towards some kind of a proportionality model where the incentive is altered. Moral lectures, and as I discussed, as we discussed earlier, sacrifice and morality are not the basis to change a country. You have to change the incentives. Politicians are not crooked fellows. They simply want to win elections. It's not a sin to want to win elections. If you make it impossible for them to win elections through fair means, they do by foul means. That's what's happened in India. So you have to switch towards some form of proportionality model. These are the two biggest things that are required in the country. Amazing, sir. Amazing. Thank you so much uh, for uh, these detailed and pretty sharp uh, responses that you have given to all of us. On one hand, this is uh, an, an, an awakening kind of a session that we have had. We have had many sessions, but uh, this one has been particularly uh, very, very interesting in, in, this, in the sense that it, it leaves with us a lots of thoughts, provokes several thoughts within us, and we have a lot of homework to do. Each one of us, we go back with these uh, takeaways and try and see what we can do. With the session that you have highlighted, those numbers, the tales that the numbers are telling uh, will have, I'm sure it's going to linger in our minds uh, for the next two, three days at least. And we start thinking about it and we spread the word. We talk to our students wherever, because we are in education, we talk to our students and others will talk to their own constituents uh, uh, in their respective domains. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, we have actually completed about uh, 90 minutes of uh, conversation. Uh, uh, and, and I think at this point, uh, with your permission, we should, uh, uh, we should pause. Uh, there is a small pause for learning. We'll never stop learning. We will definitely request you to come back to us uh, whenever it's possible as per your schedule, convenience, and uh, one in-person lecture or a discussion we can have with our area heads, professors, directors, and deans, and probably take this uh, very important matter of discussion to the students and the younger generation as well. All of us will have to be seized by this alarming concern uh, that is affecting our nation at this point in time. Uh, I'll request uh, Professor Prasad if he has any closing remarks to make. Otherwise, we can wind it up and we'll thank uh, uh, Dr. Jay Prakash Narengaru for his very, very patient and uh, very intellectually stimulating discussion and most concerning discussion that we have had in the recent past uh, in this leadership conversation that we have. Professor Prasad. I think when we started the session, it looked, uh, you know, more like economics, but it is it is more of what we need to do individually ourselves and what we need to do in the next one or two years to get the momentum up from our individual sites and from the communities that we are able to influence. I think that that is a huge, huge takeaway 
which we may not have seen in many of the other uh, webinars. Thank you. Let me just say within one sentence, I'm a great optimist. However, barren the situation appears, there are always solutions. That's what innovation, learning, and learning from others' experience are about. I am a passionate believer in the future of India. But I don't believe miracles will happen without working for them. Somehow praying to God and thinking that India will automatically prosper no matter how stupid we are in our decision making is a very silly approach. We have to make it happen. And I believe there are answers to most of our challenges. And I think collectively we can make a difference. Thank you very much for this opportunity, but I appeal to you. At least in this very specific context of the fiscal crisis impending, please raise your voices and spread the message. And we are all here to, to give you clarifications, do more research. And if you have better answers, better data, I'll be delighted to take it. This is not a doctrinal approach. This is a pragmatic approach based on evidence and logic. I hope that we will understand the magnitude of the crisis and the urgency of it and do whatever we can to make this happen. I wish you all the very best and good night. Thank you, sir. Ladies and gentlemen, that is uh, the very best, Dr. Jay Prakash Narayan with his very important uh, lecture on public finances and how poorly we are managing and result-oriented discussions on how to curb it and how to actually come out of it. On one hand, the eternal optimist in Dr. Jay Prakash Narayan, and on the other hand, the responsible citizens that we are all around the screen to, to, to at least spread the message and take cognizance of this alarming matter. I think in this conversation, this Friday evening, uh, the wise views that we have learned from the speaker today, uh, worth its time, worth its while. I want to once again thank all of you for raising some interesting questions and requesting uh, Dr. Jay Prakash Narayan to answer. Uh, and he has answered very, very patiently several questions, several conversations. One of the speaker, one of the participants has actually engaged in a running con conversation because the issue is such, the issue is such, several clarifications are always required and therefore there is a continuing dialogue. Uh, generally it doesn't happen. Uh, you'll have to excuse us, sir, but yeah. uh, the, the matter was uh, so important and the person wanted to make his own point as well. Uh, thank you so much, sir. What we do is we are going to uh, write a summary of this session. Uh, we will share a copy with you and based on your inclusions, additions and deletions and value additions, we will upload it on our archives in a text format. Apart from the recorded video format of this conversation, which will be there for all of our uh, participants and well-wishers and friends to go back and look at this at their convenient time and learn from it. Uh, we upload all the uh, conversations and we'll definitely do this also, but with your permission, once it is done, we will upload it, sir. Well, so thank you so much. On behalf of everyone at ICFI and on behalf of all the distinguished participants, I want to thank you for this blockbuster session. Thank you and good night. We'll meet all thank of them, much. all the participants again next week uh, at 6.30 p.m. On, on Friday, that is 30th of June, with Mr. Madan Padaki talking about how to create a mass entrepreneurship movement in India. That's also going to be very, very interesting. Do come back on June 30th at 6.30 p.m. Till then, have a great weekend. Good night to all of you.